This is Beyond Riel, a UMFM limited series that delves into the history, culture, and challenges facing the minority Francophone community in Canada. My name is André Marcheldon. And I'm Ian T.D. Thompson. We are excited that you have tuned in as we explore la francophonie in Canada. This series is sponsored by La Société de la Francophonie Manitobaine, the advocate for the Franco-Manitoban community. This project is also supported by a Taking a Global grant with support from the Canada Service Corps and the Government of Canada. For this inaugural episode, we will highlight the vibrant Francophone community in Manitoba. This is just one of several Francophone communities outside of Quebec with their own lively and distinct culture. The ability to study, socialize, and work in French in Manitoba will also be discussed with our guest, Chloé Frenet-Gagné. Chloé Frenet-Gagné is a Franco-Manitoban who has been involved in various student groups over the years. This has involved previously serving as the Prime Minister for the Canadian French Youth Parliament in 2018. Chloé has a Bachelor's of Arts from the University of St. Boniface, received a law degree from the University of Moncton, and is completing her Master's of Law at McGill, three degrees from three different provinces, all in French. Chloé recently started articling in Winnipeg at Friedman & Co. Immigration Law Office, and she hopes to make a career protecting the linguistic rights of the Francophone community in Manitoba. Chloé, welcome to Beyond Riel. Hi, thank you for inviting me. This is my first podcast, so pretty excited. Our conversation with Chloé highlighted that there are vibrant Francophone communities in Manitoba, New Brunswick, and across Canada. We also touched on several topics that we'll be exploring in future episodes, such as the French linguistic crisis in Manitoba and the question of who is part of the Francophone community. So the target audience for our podcast are individuals that are not part of the Francophone community and who don't know much about Francophone communities outside of Quebec. So to get started, could you share with the audience what components of your day-to-day life includes French in Winnipeg? And this can uh, be pre-pandemic or, or currently yeah. <laughs> with the pandemic, because I'm sure those two are quite different right now. Yeah. But that can also talk about a little bit from schooling, work, friends, culture, et cetera. Yeah, um, pretty much all of my life <laughs> isn't French. Well, all my daily life, like my partner, my boyfriend is, he's actually from France. So I am, I imported him <laughs> and um like all of my I've done all of my uh, education in French actually now uh, at McGill it's like a bit of English but I, I just started as you said articling in um at Freeman and Company and, it, and it's actually my first job working mostly in English um I've always kind of worked in the community um I've all kind of like the cultural activities that I that I participate in is in French. And it's not necessarily just because I, I make it a point to do everything in French. I think it just, from where I grew up and the friends that I made at school, I just always cra- gravitated towards the French community. And obviously I'm very passionate about it and I stay involved. So yeah, I mean, apart from like going to the grocery stores and like, you know, doing this, the mundane things, um, in Winnipeg, I, yeah, a lot of my, a lot of my life is in French. <laughs> in preparation for this interview, actually, I, I realized that this might be the yeah. first time that we actually have a conversation that's not in French. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because actually, I don't know if peop, uh, people know in this podcast, but me and Andre's family, um, kind of our parents are our best friends, and so we grew up together, and um, and so yeah, so that's kind of how we know each other. But uh, yeah, I think that's the first time we sp- were speaking in English. And I'm trying to, since I, I started working in English, I'm really s- trying to improve my English because even though I'm from Winnipeg, and it's funny because um, when I speak in English, people tell me that I have a French accent. But if I go, uh, for example, to Quebec or in France, when I speak in French, people think I have an English accent. So I'm kind of like in both. Um, anyways. <laughs> the way you're you're not alone i can completely relate yeah. to the exact same thing i i get told i have a french accent when i speak in english and vice versa. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah absolutely so so just like you chloe i i grew up speaking french in manitoba and i always felt the french community here was very close-knit um and that it was more than just because we we spoke a common language so I'm, I'm wondering if you feel the same way. And if so, what do you think makes the French community here in Manitoba so closely knit? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, throughout my involvement in the 
francophone community in Manitoba, but as well as in Canada, I've kind of had a, a comparison of different communities. I lived in New Brunswick and I, um, I've traveled through different communities um, throughout Canada. And I don't know, I feel like there's kind of something special about Manitoba. We're geographically very close together. For example, in BC, the francophone community is very dis dispersed. Is that how you say it? Yeah, dispersed. So for example, to do a francophone events, they have to fly everybody in. I was talking to someone that, were, that was organizing a francophone events. So it's much more difficult to have these meeting points. And uh, I feel like in Manitoba, we have the opportunity to be so close together and have organizations uh, that provide these opportunities. Like there's the francophone uh, youth group called the Conseil Jeunesse Provincial, which creates these events for us to get together. So there's the geographical part and the, the fact that we have so many opportunities to, um, to meet one each other. And there's also, I think, the um, kind of like the resilience of the community. I feel like throughout the years, there's ha there have been so many instances where our Francophone rights have been almost taken away. So I feel like every time that happens, we get a bit stronger and we, well, for me, I, I, I never take it for granted. And so I'm more and more proud of it. And I think that, for example, compared to in Quebec, where it's so normal to, to live in French, I think in minority communities, we kind of realize how, how we never have to take it for granted. So we're more, we're stronger. And, and it's funny because when I wasn't living in Montreal for school, I, I missed that community feel of the Francophone community here in Manitoba because I know I just feel like people are so are much prouder here to, to speak French and to live to be able to and to because they choose to live in French. Yeah, I so. couldn't agree more. So Winnipeg is about three quarters of a million, right? So it's not a huge city, yeah. but the Francophone <laughs> community definitely feels like a, a small village yeah. essentially within the big city. It's always the way that I kind of felt it. So I always felt yeah. it was very closely knit together. And it's great that you've actually talked or, or mentioned about uh, the Francophone rights and how they were uh, essentially taken away for, for quite a few years, because that's a great segue for our next podcast or next episode, actually, which is going to be going into much more detail on that. So you also briefly touched a little bit how the Francophone community compares in other provinces, and you talked about BC a little bit, but you've also lived in New Brunswick as well as mm -hmm. in Montreal. So could you go into a little bit more detail how uh, it is to live in Francophone communities in those provinces? Yeah, so um, when I decided to go to law school, there's no Francophone law school in Manitoba. There is now a program where you can take um, like a bilingual program. So when I decided to um, move for law school, it was between Ottawa or Moncton. And I really gravi gravitated to Moncton because I felt like the Acadian community is kind of like a twin community with Manitoba. And I really felt that when I moved there. So I was there for about three years. And when I was meeting Acadian people, Acadians are the French community in, in New Brunswick. And I really felt like we knew each other. And it's funny because when we meet Francophones, we already feel like we're, we're kind of connected in some ways. In Manitoba here, we always ask like, oh, who's your parents? How do we know each other? Are we are we a family here in some ways? <laughs> Anyways, but um, when I went to New Brunswick, the people were exactly like Franco-Manitobans. And we kind of had the same, you know, a way of thinking, the same, um, there was, you know, improv and different events that we could go to for French people. And so, yeah, I really felt like Manitoba and New, and New Brunswick was very similar. And then when I moved to... To Quebec, it's, yeah, so as I mentioned before, it's a bit different there because French is the majority language. And so it's kind of, how do I say this? I don't know. But like, it's, because obviously you want to live all, all of your life in French. And in Montreal, I kind of had the opportunity to do that. But then I felt like people were taking everything for granted. And obviously I'm generalizing here, but that was kind of my feeling. And I didn't feel that community feel. And that's partly because, you know, they're, they're not the minority group. And um, 
And so I kind of missed that part. But at the same time, it was nice to like, you know, go to the restaurant and just speak in French. And it was just normal. And you would hear people speaking in French in the streets. You know, in Manitoba, it's like when you hear someone speak in French in the street, your ear kind of like immediately pops up and you're kind of listening to... <laughs> to the conversation but um so the opposite experience was really really nice but very different from what i'm used to all right I, I, i'm i'm gonna jump in here i'm uh i i'm i'm one less less knowledgeable in in the areas of, of francophone communities um in general and i guess that's the angle that i'm coming in with this podcast and so i'm 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 more curious about some of the some of the greater challenges so in in your perspective what are some of the biggest challenges um, of being a francophone in manitoba that's a good question i think andre also if you have any answers to that but i think that when people are not aware of like the um you know what the, the francophone community in manitoba is they kind of automatically look to the statistics and they kind of see the numbers and okay, we're in Manitoba, I forget exactly the number, but I think from people who speak where it's their native language, I think it's like 7% or I'm not sure exactly what it is, but, and so they kind of see that and they say, oh, well, you know, it's five or 6%. Why are, why are they asking so many rights? Why, why are they, um, um, you know, militating for for all those rights if they're only such a minority but I think that the issue is now how do we get people to go beyond those numbers and for example last uh, in 2019 I forget exactly when but there was um, an author in Quebec who's called Denise Bombardier I don't know if you we wanted to talk about that but <laughs> she's um, a well-known author in Quebec and she went on a national television show called Tout Mon Appal, which is kind of like the most watched news show in Quebec and said, oh, well, you know, they don't speak French anymore in, in Manitoba. Um, you know, there's like the, the language is dead in Manitoba. They're only like, I forget, she, she gave it like a statistical number. And to that, she assumed that, you know, we didn't speak anymore. And no one there at the table was there to rebuke what she said. And I kind of went into meet the media and I said like this, like, you know, this is ridiculous, you know, because I feel like people, yeah, they, they base their, they base it too much on the numbers and, you know, they, they, she didn't even take the time to talk to us before saying that. So anyways, there was a whole documentary on it and she didn't change her mind. It was just, I had the opportunity to go on that show to, to tell her story. And I feel like for, 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 Anglophones living in Manitoba. I think, yeah, I don't know, Andre. What do you think? <laughs> I'm, I'm maybe one thing you could touch on, Troy, and I can touch on it as well is uh, just essentially the challenge of making the youth, like the, the kids that are going to elementary, understand what it means to grow up as a francophone oh, in Manitoba. Yeah. Because when you go to school, you go to a French school, but then as soon as the kids, and it was the same thing for myself as well, my friends, as soon as you start learning English, you, the kids start speaking English in school. And then you, yeah. you just need to tell the, the students to, to actually speak in French. And that's quite a challenge. But then when they grow up, the kids end up being much prouder and really understanding the importance of maintaining their, their French culture. Yeah. And I think that, um, yeah, that's a good point because, you know, when a main thing we hear is that like in Francophone schools and immersion schools, because there is a huge immersion community in Manitoba as well. We hear only English in the, the corridors. And um, I feel like at school sometimes the way that they, they try to encourage uh, kids to speak French is that they, you know, they punish them when they speak English. You know, I remember when I was at school, when we spoke uh, English, we had like a ticket or a ticket or like, you know, we had some like a... And I feel like we take, we spend too much time on that and not enough time on, you know, showing them what are the, what are the opportunities they can have if they speak French, not just to get a good job, but, you know, different events in the community and how also English is not the devil. You know, I feel like sometimes they make us feel like when you're a kid, and you get tickets for speaking in English, then you kind of feel like, oh, well, they're saying that English is bad. So, okay, well, and then they kind of rebel and then they just only speak English. <laughs> but I feel like if we teach them how there's so many other opportunities to speak French outside of school, 
And also, um, we need to create more opportunities for francophones and people, and not only francophones, you know, where it's their native language, but people from immersion and people who just want to learn French to do other things. Like, for example, there's the Conseil Jeunesse Provincial, which is a, a youth group, which kind of creates opportunities from, for kids to uh, uh, 14 till 25 like different events to, for them to meet each other. And then, but there's a new group that started, which is I think 25, for, for people 25 and older, it's pretty much everybody else, <laughs> where it's like events for like networking and learning about, you know, the environment and workshops for, you know, for just for young adults and young families to have the opportunity to speak in French and to meet to meet everyone and yeah i i just want to i just want to kind of clarify a few things so like it sounds like you know some of the elements are firstly that you know there previously was a little bit of a kind of you know i'm looking at this from from psychology you know we always talk about the difference between punishment and reinforcement and mm -hmm. it sounds like previously in the schools there's a little bit of of punishment of of kind of, if, of english yet you know, now it's a little bit more of just reinforcement and encouraging people to use friends rather than punishing people when they're using English. And I guess the other aspect in terms of in terms of that documentary that you talked about, it's kind of like instead of looking at just like the simplistic numbers themselves, it's more about the quality of the community itself. Is that kind of a fair way to kind of characterize some of the some of the challenges uh, that, that have faced the, the Francophone community in Manitoba over the years? Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think that, you know, at the time with, you know, the, I'm sure in the next episode, you'll talk about the linguistic crisis in the 80s. And, you know, just the, the fear, I think, Francophones in, at, in that time, you know, there was this fear of like the English mm -hmm, mm -hmm. community assimilating the Francophone community and like the suppression of rights and everything. And so I understand the, where, where our teachers came from, you know, it's like kind of suppressed by the, 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 the majority and it turned out to be the, the English community. And so there was this fear, but I feel like now the community really evolved from that time. Mm -hmm. I feel like the, the anglophone community and the francophone has really worked together throughout the years and like there's you can just look at the immersion how many immersion schools there are there are in manitoba and the inscription rates in those schools and how people want to learn french i feel like french is not like because you know at, during the linguistic crisis people were writing like no more french and people were afraid that they that the francophone community would take their rights like the anglophone rights and you know we would spend too much money on the french community and, and i feel like now it's much more it's appreciated appreciated like yeah and yeah. and celebrated i feel like the, the francophone community is much more celebrated in Manitoba today so I feel like the approach to to encouraging our youth to continue speaking French and continue to celebrate their cultures is has to be a bit more different than before and I feel like probably also generational you know differences yeah no that that's interesting just in terms of historical context no Andre and I'll, I'll let you jump in here I was just going to say it's perfect that you're talking about uh, the Denise Bombardier comment because that's actually something we want to touch on in a future mm. episode as well. So for our first episode of <laughs> yeah, this podcast, okay. you're touching on a lot of future topics <laughs> we want to we want to cover. So this is great. Yeah. Um, I, I I guess like you've kind of touched on on a few aspects of this, but but I guess keeping in line with these these series of questions, is is there anything else that you would want maybe people outside of the francophone community to know about the community? People from either the anglophone or, or the non on, non French communities. What would you like those people to know about the community? Um, well, first I think that I hope that they don't feel like they're excluded from it. I feel like over the years, the definition of what a francophone is has really evolved. For example, mm -hmm. I forget in what year, but we kind of changed what the definition of, of a francophone is. I think before it was more like, oh, you were, um, if your parents, you know, what we call in French, the ayant droit. So um, from a legal standpoint, um, there's that definition, but now it's much more if you want to learn French, if you um, you feel a connection to it, if you went to immersion school or not, even if you're just learning French, you can be a Francophone. So I feel like 
I, I want them to know that we're very welcoming. We're not, we're not a cult. <laughs> and, um, and there's much more than the Festival du Voyageur. I mean, that, that's an essential part of who we are, but it's much more than just the traditional um, Voyageur part of it. Yeah, I think that's a message that I would give them. And to not be afraid to come to our events if you don't, even if you don't understand a lot, a lot of it, then, but at least you'll get a feel of who we are. And, um, you know, we're not just angry francophones who fight for our rights. I feel like that's a, a consumption that people can have. For sure. Yeah. So uh, it's great that you also mentioned like who's part of the francophone community. That's, that's something else we want to talk on, uh, talk about on, on this podcast. So for anyone who's lived in Winnipeg before, it's, it's obvious that English is the predominant language. So uh, a perspective that folks might have is just that since that's the common language and that's the only language really that you would need to be able to, to live, work, and, and socialize in Manitoba, what, what really makes it important to keep speaking French and to maintain that French culture here in, in Manitoba and not to, let's say, move to Quebec where it would be that much easier? It's just... When I, when I think about this question, I always think of like, you know, the people who went to the Supreme Court to, to fight for our rights and the rights of our education. And I just, I just think of those people and what they would say. And I think it's so important to keep, to keep that, the French Francophone aspect in your life. And it's only going to be a benefit to you. And um, it's going to be a bit harder, but it's going to be so rewarding and important. And know that if you live a part of your life in English, then that's totally okay too, you know. And it, it really has to be celebrated because I love it. And I think you should love it too. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks a lot to Chloe for, for kind of going over all these really important topics and kind of touching on a lot of topics that we'll be covering in the future episodes as well. So to, to just uh, close out, uh, um, Ian and I were wondering if you had any final thoughts on any topics that uh, we might not have covered in this first episode that you think would be important to share with our audience. I think that the next kind of important um, aspect of the Francophone community uh, in Manitoba to kind of speak on is the importance of having um, post-secondary education in French. I think that's another big thing of how we can keep our community um, being in good health. I don't know if that's how you say it, but for example, a lot of people have to to move uh, to different, like I did, to different provinces to be able to go uh, have an education, post-secondary education in French. And I think that we should we have to keep working on it and keep our government accountable to it. And um, I think that's another important issue that we'll just have to keep in mind and keep boring, working towards it. Another thing that I, I would probably tell francophones or people who are learning French to encourage them to keep living their francophone life or having keep having that aspect in their life is to um, not be afraid of their their accent and how they speak in French we call it the um, security linguistique so I'm, again I'm, I'm touching on, on another thing <laughs> you'll speak on later but I think celebrating the different um, accents in the francophone community in Manitoba but also in other provinces there's so many different amazing accents and just to normalize it and celebrate it is such an important aspect of the flourishing community and another important aspect of it and I think that even in schools maybe learning about the different accents and just make it make them beautiful and and not be afraid of it is is really important so I will tell I would tell them that everybody should be secure when they speak yeah I would say that perfect well thanks a lot Chloe we really appreciate it and uh hope our audience did as well yeah thank you thank you for inviting me thank you for tuning in to beyond real join us in our next episode where we will explore the history of the French language in Manitoba executive producers and hosts are Andre Mathieu-Don and Ian T.D. Thompson Technical producer is Frédéric Demers, and consulting producer is Gabrielle Tuga. The music you hear on Beyond Riel is by Rayana. To hear more of her music, visit rayana.com. That's R-A-Y-A-N-N-A-H.com. 
Beyond Real is a UMFM 101.5 limited series broadcasted out of the University of Manitoba. For more information on the series, visit umfm.com. Dommage, quel triste, quel